Uh, years ago, when I was in high school and college, I was in a rock band. Technically, I guess you could describe it as hard rock and maybe even a little bit heavy metal. And um, I, tell, I, I share this because there are a lot of different traditions of music, to use that word, tradition of music. You have hard rock, you have more pop music, country, hip-hop, you have classical music, jazz, etc. Each of these types or traditions of music have their own roots. They go back a long ways and, and you can almost trace the different bands that influenced the other bands and how they came up with their sound. Uh, the, if you take just one little area, for example, like heavy metal hair bands from the 80s, you can drill down into that and you can start to see certain things about that type of music that they all have in common. Like one of the things that my uh, wife always says about that music is that there's always screaming at the top of their lungs, really high notes, and there's always um, too many guitar solos. So every, every song's got at least one guitar solo and they're all really fast and you know uh, flashy and there's a lot of distortion on the guitars and and each tradition of music has its own feel its own flavor its own sound and the more you listen to those types of music the more they're really obviously different than other types of music if you put on a heavy metal jazz I mean heavy metal in a in a jazz record side by side you would hear wow these things are really different they have different roots and they have different sounds and it's very similar to areas of research. In our field, the field of communication, there are a number of traditions of research that our uh, textbook this semester and some different authors have articulated that help us make sense of why different research feels you know, so unique compared to some of the other things. So one of your teachers might talk about communication one way and another another way. And and uh, it can be confusing. So we're going to look at those traditions of research and this will probably clarify quite a bit about the way your different people, your, your different teachers talk and it's also going to clarify beyond the area of communication. It's probably going to help you understand the other fields of research, maybe in your other courses, in your minor perhaps. So the first tradition of research is the oldest. It's rhetoric. And this area, if you've taken any rhetoric classes with some of the other professors, then you know they're concerned about speech making, the way arguments are constructed, and persuasive speaking in general. When you're studying this area, you're studying speeches, you're looking possibly at debates, or even taking a debate course, and you look at how decisions are made, how people deliberate and ultimately make decisions. If you have ever watched any televised uh, bits of people arguing in Congress. You've seen someone's at the podium and they're arguing and then someone else might get up and they're arguing and and you know it's all very cannot be very technical sometimes and it's not necessarily great TV to watch that it's kind of boring but they're arguing about the merits of a particular passing a particular law or not and that's really what rhetoric is about. It's about how we understand arguments and how we make decisions together as a society. It's rooted, I said it's the oldest, it's rooted in 5th century Greek democracy. They didn't have a democracy the way we have it, um, but what they did have is talking. In other words, they needed the art of discourse, communication, to resolve social needs rather than the sword. You can go in and you can have the might is right, the might is right approach. Might is right. Have you heard that expression? In other words, the guy with the sharpest sword wins, or you can talk about things. I mean, those are really the two main ways that society has been shaped. We can talk about things or we can fight about things. And so communication is meant to be an alternative to using war, using the sword as a way to get things done. And the artful use of, of communication is the idea that we persuade audiences, audiences to a particular course of action. So you convince people, you shape your argument, your words, the examples that you pick, how you come across, the research you cite, all those things will make your argument a stronger argument or a weaker argument. And your, meant, your goal is to persuade an audience to side with you, to pick your direction. And they invented this, the Greeks and, and um, came up with this idea about democracy and then started writing books about rhetoric, the art of discourse.
using communication to persuade. Um, Aristotle wrote a book called On Rhetoric that many graduate students especially have read, but some undergrads have read it too. And it's all about how to, how to shape your argument to convince audiences in the best way possible. You've probably heard of ethos, pathos, logos. Ethos means the credibility or believability of the speaker, him or herself. To what extent do you find that person to be of good character, to have integrity, and essentially, do you believe them? When they speak, do they seem like the kind of person who speaks the truth? Pathos is the way that the speaker appeals to the audience's emotions. This is often done through stories, personal stories, and, and we get caught up, our emotions get caught up in hearing uh, what people's lives are like, how they succeed, how they suffer, where they, you know, the, the before and after stories that we love so much, rags to riches, etc. They, they touch our hearts, they appeal to our emotions. And then logos, which is really the evidence the reasoning, the logos means words, the actual concrete words or evidence that you bring to that argument. So ethos, pathos, logos, those are common. You've probably heard of those since your very first class in communication. And this area of research te also teaches us to be more critical listeners of arguments and to see the flaws or problems with another party's argument and evidence. So maybe if we had never studied communication, never studied arguments, public speaking, rhetoric, you might hear a message and think, oh, wow, that's amazing, right? But then you've taken a little bit of public speaking and you've, you've understood that people are making arguments and then you might not be quite as convinced. For example, if all they, the person did was tell story after story about how, uh, let's say, a particular medication was just amazing, but they never gave you that evidence, that this, the general studies that see what that show whether or not this uh, research that this medication was effective, then you might say, you know what, they're telling a lot of stories, but what about the times it doesn't work? I remember years ago watching uh, some kind of infomercial about a psychic on television, and they just had, oh, she, you know, she told me everything I knew. So it's one of these numbers you call up and you pay by the minute, and you call up and they tell you everything. Uh, you know, they tell you your future and things like that. And so the infomercial is meant to get people to call the 800 number so they can charge money. And they had some celebrity on there saying she's the best, this psychic is the best. And then the celebrity said, you know, a lot of, a lot of you may be wondering, is this true? Where's the evidence? And then he said, well, listen to this. And then they went, instead of doing some kind of large random sample research, they just told one more story of one more person that seemed to be an actor, by the way, you know, like a paid actor just saying the lines. <clears throat> and they said, and then after they told the little story, they, the, the celebrity looked at the camera and said, now do you believe? And I thought to myself, well, all you have been doing is showing these personal illustrations, pathos, appealing to our emotions, but you haven't really shown us that this makes sense or works. I mean, what again, what about those times where people didn't hear something that corresponded. Let's say you talk to 100 people and only 10 of them did this advice or fortune telling or what have you match up. And what if you only show the 10 times that it worked and you ignore the 90% of the times it failed? So that those are the kinds of questions. Once you learn how to evaluate arguments, you might see there's some certain things lacking. So the rhetoric tradition often gets confused with the socio-psychological tradition for some reason, even though once you know them very well, they're nothing alike. But uh, because they have very superficial things in common, sometimes people get confused. So the socio-psychological tradition, which is a mouthful, is broken down. Of course, the main root of there is psychological. So a lot of this research is going to sound just like the research and theories that you might hear in a psychology class. It's the more social side of that psychological research, uh, which is why we have this compound word, but it's still very psychological. So if you think of the difference right there, arguments and persuasion and talking to an audience or debating is very different than psychology. Psychology looks at individual people, right? You sit down with a psychologist, they talk about what's going on in your brain. And that's very similar to the way we are uh, researching communication in this area of research. So it focuses on people's 
individual communication behavior, just like psychology. It sees communication as a process of expression and influence. That's where people get confused. It sounds like rhetoric. Oh, influence. That sounds like the word persuasion, which is part of the rhetoric tradition, the rhetorical tradition. Well, let's look at this another way. Expression is just speaking, and influence is the effect it has, the cause effect relationship. So they're looking at essentially, they're looking at what psychological factors are influencing how we express ourselves and what ways of expressing, uh, of listening to communication is going to directly impact us in a particular way, a, a predictable way. This area looks at experiments to do their research, surveys, maybe you've filled out a survey or two in your life, or sometimes focus groups to learn about how particular messages, for example, if you say it this way, what effect does it have? Or maybe you change out the sender, you have the same message, but you change the person who says it, or perhaps the channel is, is something have a greater impact if it's said face-to-face -face versus over social media, etc. So in other words, they, they, sh they look at these experiments, focus groups, uh, surveys, and they, they swap out different variables to see what the particular results will be. So uh, if I have long hair, do you believe you know, do you believe what I say? If I have short hair, will you buy my product, e etc. And notice, they're not looking at debates. This is very different when you look at their methods. They're not looking at debates. They're not looking at one person standing in front of an audience and, and talking about an argument, forming an argument, trying to convince people. What they're doing is they're looking at the individual person and what is going on in their brain and how the processes in their own brain are changing the outcome, whether or not they believe that certain, certain things are happening or uh, that convince them. Uh, what are they noticing? Do they care about your age? Do they care about your eye color? Do they care about gender? And they're looking at all those factors. If you want to think about it, it's a lot like marketing, right? They want people want to market to you in the most clever way possible, and so they figure out what's going to really push your buttons, cause effect, right? What's what causes can they manipulate or change uh, to get a certain effect? So research in the socio-psychological tradition relies very heavily on cause-effect thinking. Cause-effect thinking means that if you change a certain cause, you will have a different effect. You're pulling one lever and you're seeing what result that uh, lever will have. It also focuses on the individual person's social behavior, psychological variables of the individual, individual effects, personality traits, perception, and cognition, all focused on the individual. In fact, these words that are underlined cause effect and individual are key words that you will see circling back around and around when, whenever we talk about socio-psychological research, that's because they are in the business of looking into individual people's minds and looking at individual people's behaviors in, in a very cause-effect way. So this quote from Bob Craig in 1999 digs a little deeper into that. He says, communication problems are thought of as situations that call for the effective manipulation, or in other words, modification, of the causes of behavior in order to produce the desired outcomes. So the word manipulation here is a technical word. It's not, I know that in normal life, you, you shouldn't manipulate people. We're not talking about manipulating people in a negative way like that. We're using the word more like modification. Uh, in the technical sense, if you turn the knob on a gadget, or push some buttons on a gadget to lower the volume, to raise the volume, you're manipulating those variables. And in the same way, a lot of this research is accomplished by making small changes to the different things you're trying to study to see if it changes the outcome. For example, you might do a study and one of your, the studies that you do is you have someone get interviewed by an interviewer and you might change, the, let's say the person who is being interviewed, the interviewee, all you do is change the gender of that person. That's the one variable you're manipulating. 
And then you see, but you know, that person gives the same answers as the, the, the females give the same answers as the males. And then you'd see how the interviewers uh, rated those different applicants for the job. And you would see, well, does gender have an effect? So let's, uh, you keep all the resumes the same, you keep all of their answers essentially the same. The only thing you really change is the gender. Even the age is the same, the education level, everything. And so you just change or modify, manipulate that one variable that one cause to see what the effect is. And that is, do we think that that person is more hireable or less hireable? So that's an example of how uh, we're using, we're looking at those individual changes and that cause effect thinking, as well as how those different little variables are manipulated. And it doesn't have to be gender, it could be anything. You could change anything about the person, their hair color, their eye color. You can get very specific in terms of you know what kind of tie they're wearing and if it's if their clothes are slightly out of fashion or if they're the latest styles. You could change any tiny little variable. Usually though, people in this area will only change one variable at a time so they can isolate that variable and really see if it's that's the change that is influencing the outcome of how people are perceived or how we're thinking about people. So, like the previous slide, who would you hire as a salesperson? Happy guy number one with the thumbs up? Overly happy, I guess you could say. Now the guy in the middle, who looks a little bit more moderate, he looks pleasant and has his hand out. Or Mr. Stressed Out here, who's drinking coffee straight from the pot, obviously late, looking at his clock, looking at his watch, and untucked uh, shirt and, and messy hair and uh, I would ask you what would you change so I, I'm just gonna assume here based upon past conversations that the guy that you would hire let's say you have a company you'd probably if these this is really how they look you'd probably hire the guy in the middle right and so the mistake would be thinking that oh the guy in the middle is the best person to hire in in, in this socio psychological research we don't really think about that what we do is instead is look at person number one salesperson number one job applicant number one I should say and what would you change what would you modify about this fella to make him more hireable maybe you would take that overexcited expression off his face soften it a little bit maybe instead of the thumbs down uh, thumbs up he could he could uh, just put his hands at his side or something, maybe back off a little bit. He's a little bit close up, a little intense. And I, most people would probably say, yeah, that would make him more hireable. And then the guy all the way to the right, you would say, obviously, tuck in your shirt, straighten the tie, um, fix your hair, put the coffee pot down, fix your sleeves a little bit. And we could instantly make this fella appear more hireable. So what we're doing there is we're modifying or manipulating variables to get a different result. And let's say we just formed a little experiment right now and said, okay, let's let's uh, change those things. And if we change those things, I'm sure that certain individuals on their rating sheet would rate them a little bit better than they would right now. So that's a little example of how you might do a very brief or very simple, oversimplistic really, socio-psychological experiment.